Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. <rire> Muchas gracias. No me voy a hablar en, en inglés, pero quisiera decir unas palabras en... No falo portugués, des, desgraciadamente, en, en, en español para agradecer a todos. Para decir primero que es un honor, uh, un grande honor para mí uh, de estar con vosotros aquí en el sur, donde está el futuro del mundo en el sur. Eh, segundo, fue una ocasión, es, esta ocasión no va a acabarse, es una ocasión de aprender de manera muchísima interesante una tantas cosas del mundo real con una base teórica que no una base abstracta pero una base apreciativa de la realidad que se piensa en un conjunto de diálogos muchos muchos diálogos con el pueblo que concierne sus estudios. Para eso, muchas gracias. Y además es un placer inmenso de estar con ustedes, es, no sé, cinco, seis, desde unos años, con muchos de vosotros y especialmente con uh, el profesor Lastres y el profesor uh, Casiolato, que nos encontramos por primera vez hace muchos años en un otro aniversario uh, de nuestro amigo uh, Christopher uh, Freeman en el, en el centro de uh, Spru uh, en Sussex. Now uh, I will uh, go on with uh, this very pleasing uh, meeting where hard work is combined with uh, uh, good fun. I was assigned this, uh, uh, to work with this table about new forms of development and the roads leading to the future. Uh, I was a, a little uh, puzzled, uh, but I understood, I think, that we have uh, to make changes. To make the necessary changes by a common action, to advocate new forms of evolution towards a desirable future, we must share a common assessment of what has been the forms of evolution and the roads worked on in the name of development and that have led us to the present situation. I will have two points. The first one will be uh, historical, positive. The second one is more normative, and uh, I will make suggestion, but it is in common that we will build uh, the uh, next 20 or uh, more uh, years. This uh, uh, point One is uh, to speak about the so-called developed countries. They are still heading the race towards higher levels of GDP per capita, a race that started around 500 years ago. On which roads these developed countries have worked on? This will be what I try to recalled in point two, three, and four, and what was the vehicle they used? They used power, power on the people, power on nature, power of national and transnational organization. The main target, GDP growth. It was proposed finally in 1949 to the ex-colonized countries and to, to be independent country to start a process of development. 
They understood that they were invited to reproduce the advances in the material life that the people in rich country were enjoying or were promised to enjoy soon. These lagging behind countries accepted the idea that they were keen to get an help to catch up. Development clearly meant modern growth. The United Nations endorsed this vision. Thus, from, time, from that time up until now, nations have been ranked as developing or developed according to the value of their GDP per capita. This is the official, the conventional, and the usual way to assess what is called development. It means that in the name of development, a country has to work on roads leading to a larger GDP to have a higher level of GDP per capita. What have been these roads? Just two preliminary remarks before recalling what these roads have been. First, the ranking of country means that there is a hierarchy of countries and that each one has a place in this hierarchy according to the level of the GDP per capita it has reached. But this is not like a hierarchy of climbers making for a summit where finally, soon or late, everyone will join the summit and all will enjoy the landscape. No, there is no summit. Even the advanced are still climbing. They are climbing forever to reach higher and higher levels and to keep their advanced position vis-à-vis -vis the others. This is the first flow of this vision of development and of its implementation. The second flow is that this vision of development is a nonsense vision and a dangerous one. Let us quote Kenneth Balding, anyone who believes in indefinite growth in anything physical on a physical finite planet is either mad or an economist. That's it. Our uh, Korean economist uh, have a very uh, famous book, Kicking Away the Ladder. Three remarks. First, advanced countries are still in processes of national, regional, urban development everywhere in France, in the United States. They do not stand at the top of a mountain or at the top of a column like in this illustration. They are climbing to advance higher. Second, advanced countries have decided to help the other country to develop officially since 1989. 49, United Nations programs have been implemented and other programs by a host of organizations like the World Bank and the last one is the, has been quoted by my friend and by uh, Gabriela. For almost 70 years, three However, it seems that not only have the advanced countries climbed higher, but they have destroyed the paths, the ladders they have used to climb, and the ex-colonies are still struggling for development. Now, what was the, the road they uh, borrowed? First, they went from agriculture to trade. Historical statistics by Madison show that the definitive setting of a hierarchy with growing inequalities between countries in the level of development started after uh, 1500. Before that, the material and intellectual life relied on a productive cultivation of nature and agriculture. These spaces supported the rest, useful artifacts from poetry to houses and castles and also other cultural activities than the sole utilitarian ones. At that time, the intrinsic value of everything was crucial. A good was good, good for something and able to satisfy a real need of someone. This means that anything coming from agriculture is able to respond to the need of food to survive, or say any pottery is able to respond to the need of tools to prepare food, or else textile is able to respond to the need of clothes to face cold weather, etc. All that time, only a small proportion of production was distributed through markets, sometimes on a barter scheme. But things started to change from intrinsic values to trade and exchange value. Step by step, 
commerce gained in importance in Western Europe for handicrafts and then for tropical products with the colonial times, leading to the extension of the markets within advanced countries spreading the use of money. The meaning of value change. Nature and agriculture and their interesting value were overcome by trade and exchange value. The value of something became its ability to sold in a market and to bring money according to its exchange value or a price as a quantity of money. This money, often a metal like gold, can be stored, accumulated, and possibly used at any time in the future. Thus, production of goods up to a certain extent was no longer organized solely in order to respond to a local need, but to make money in selling them anywhere so that it becomes possible to buy, to import something, and to accumulate. Wealth is now on, assessed by the amount of accumulated money or the amount of the market exchange value of accumulated tradable things. From trade to manufactures. In the 19th century, trade involved relatively low volumes of goods, especially international trade, compared to what was produced within the countries. In 1820, trade across boundaries still amounts at less than 1% of the world production. The change came from the search of manufacturers. As Smith put it, manufacturers can be consumed without limits, which is not the case for food due to the narrow capacity of our stomach. Manufacturers brought surplus compared to the necessary to survive, but that surplus tended to become an ingredient of pleasant life. It is sugar. And it seemed that human desire for sugar uh, for them was not limited. The law of supply and demand detected the exchange value and accumulation of money could rise with the growth of the production of manufacture. The race for unlimited accumulation and growth was launched. Commodification of labor. From exchange value to labor value. There was a debate about value and the wealth of nations at the time of Smith, who argued that trade improved the wealth of nations in raising the amount of exchange value. Ricardo did not agree. For him, labor, labor was a source of value and wealth on the one hand, and as trade let unchange the quantity of labor within the nation on the other hand, the intrinsic, the real wealth of the nation was too unchanged. Scholars tried to be in favor of one argument or the other, and one focal point for discussion was linked to the essence of manufacturers. Manufacturers means, means hand made, man, manu, is it la mano. Its links to labor is essential. Performed in urban areas, and the role of nature is now more remote than in agriculture located in rural areas. It's Marx who insisted on the crucial point, the observed commodification of labor. From now on, there will be a labor market, the market of working forces to leading to a wage price for a quantity of work, as a precursor, an hour or one day or else. Factory buys a one-day working force at its exchange value, a wage. It uses the one-day labor value, the intrinsic value of labor, and it sells the outcome of the work, the manufactured goods, at the exchange value, the price in the market. The difference between the two exchange value, the wage of the worker and the price of the goods, makes a profit for the factory. Profit comes from the worker's ability to produce more value than it cost. And this extra is named by Marx the surplus value made on labor. The surplus value, which is a profit, can be accumulated partly to hire new workers and to build new factories and then to accumulate more exchange value. Accumulation is the engine of growth. And what is the vehicle on this road? The vehicle is power. First, power on the people. Industrialization and factories were established first in England, in Western Europe, by a dominant social class, 
the industrial bourgeoisie. It is this class that organizes the work in factories. The capitalist, owner of the factory with its machines, paid workers at the subsistence level. This was their exchange value as they were numerous, chased from the countryside after the enclosure law and their impossibility to get there what was necessary for them to survive. Industrial revolution meant exploitation of the workers and the birth of the proletariat in the sake of accumulation. Accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. Accumulation for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake, said Marx. The capitalist country, during their process of development, have imposed their laws on the, worth of the rest of the world. It was named imperialism. It was operated through invasion and colonization of almost all the rest of the planet and with the help of financial capital and multinational corporation, it was the spoliation of people. Thus, development, he said, in advanced de countries has been rich by exerting power upon people in their countries and upon peoples in the rest of the world. This is an image uh, from the trade union in the United States of America in uh, 1910 uh, or 1912, uh, something like that. It's a pyramid of a capitalist system. It's better than the ladder image. Power on nature. Thank you. Development of advanced economy has not been only based on the power exerted upon people. It has been also the outcome of the power of production, list, that is power exerted upon nature, which comes from human knowledge, Marshall, allowing innovation and technical change to better. Let's go then. The prosperity of a nation is not, as say believes, say the French, greater in the proportion in which it has amassed more wealth, that is, values of exchange, but in the proportion in which it has more developed its powers of production. 1841. Knowledge is our most powerful engine of production. It enables us to subdue, to subdue nature, to submit nature, and force her to satisfy our wants. Marshall, 1890. Schumpeter got rid of the static economic theory and analyzed the evolution and Winklung in Deutsch, in uh, German. The development was said in 1911. He, he stated that the engine was an innovative entrepreneur at that time, and then in 1942 named the capitalist way of working a perennial gale of creative destruction led by large corporations. This is technical change. In order to subdue nature, such a power has been exerted on it that it is almost exhausted and no longer able to support the pursuit of this form of development. Power of national and transnational organization. To deal with the real world, we must deal with power issues. In eluding power, in making economics a non-political subject, neoclassical theory destroys the relation of economics to the real world. Schumpeter praised the power of the large-scale enterprise. Escaping the market law with his strategy, it has come to be the most powerful engine of economic progress, and in particular, of the long-run expansion of total output. Thank you, Schumpeter. John Kenneth Calbright analyzed the necessity of countervailing powers. When the modern corporation acquires power over markets, power in the community, power over the state, and power over belief, it is a political instrument, different in form and degree, but not in kind from the state itself. Politics does become a part of economics. We cannot do as if development is just a problem of innovation, of technical change, of management. Ludwal 2007 agreed that one weakness of the system of innovation approach is that it is still lack kill, lacking in its treatment of the power aspect of development. The word evolution is the result of the interaction between policies of states and strategies of transnational cooperation that succeeded to influence states' policies to their advantage 
Financialization is the last stage that diffuses the precaria everywhere. Uh, this is a, a presentation of the two main organizations, the state and the government on one side and the firms on the other side. After 1929, uh, development state, welfare state, try to organize market and partly production, and 30% uh, of GDP, and now it's uh, around 50%, for the purpose of the GDP was taken by the government to organize a society, and this make possible a minimum cohesion of the country, finding itself a self-organization as a system, self-organization was mentioned by Cleonis, and on the horizontal uh, direction, it is a direction of a, a national project, national direction of the territory, and in this territory, there are factories, but uh, they constitute they are constituting the territorial structure of production, which is uh, up to a certain point in time, controlled by the government, by the people. These factories are contributed to the advance towards uh, the objective of the national project. The firms, the single country firms are less and less important in percentage of local production and in percentage of employment. A higher, higher percentage comes from multi-country firms with factories in several countries. Local factories need more and more imports of intermediate products and machines. Thus, firms are competing in the international scene across country boundaries. It is in this global scene that it is built the technological and the industrial trajectory. In the vertical axis, this is the direction of these trajectories. It is the outcome of a competition between uh, state policies and firm strategy. It is not longer a country which is able to lead. It is now uh, uh, every country are competing with other and with firms. And the articulation is able or not uh, to make possible that the direction of uh, the evolution of uh, the territorial uh, structure, territorial of production of a country is in line or not with the direction of the evolution of the global industrial system. If not, if they are orthogonal, uh, like two vectors orthogonal have a, s a scalar product equal to zero, this country is lagging behind. If it is in line, it will be uh, in a better position. I will go, I think the time is running, five minutes, so I will not explain how this uh, is uh, uh, going on now. Because I have no time, and I will try to say uh, something about the uh, second part. New forms of evolution needed to make for a desirable future. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. So let's have some hope. What we need is to have a new societal paradigm. Capitalist or liberal economy are living on a social contract which is now broken. And there is no jobs, productivity, and rise of median income. There is unemployment. There is productivity, but decline in the median income. We have to change this uh, paradigm and uh, progress is still urgent, but it must be a progress in all components of the human condition. We cannot have a uniform vision across the world. Anyway, we need, if we are still a single humanity, share a common vision concerning ends which are ethical and political. With a group of activists and academics, we have tried uh, 
after Illich works Tools for Conviviality, to think about this idea of conviviality and to try to make uh, the doctrine or the doctrinal basis of conviviality. If uh, liberalism is the basis of uh, doctrine for liberty, for freedom, convivialism would be what we need. We have a lot of, of uh, uh, publication, even in, in Portuguese, and there are four principles. First principle, principle of common humanity. It is an inescapable fact that, of observation that anyone is a member of single common humanity, which is living with common universe. There is no natural reason for any discrimination, and respect is due to living to every living creature and to nature. This is a principle of extended fraternity. Second principle of common sociality. Human beings are social beings and any individual exists only if any other one of people welcome its venue, organize its acculturation, so that this person shares a common world. This implies implementation of an essential solidarity which is an ethic and um, creative of humanity. Third principle, principle of individuation. Every human being is welcome into an educated and educated by a group where she, he gradually creates and constructs her his own unique individuality by developing her, his power to be an act, giving recognition and empathy to others and expecting the same on their part. This is the principle of individual freedom. Fourth principle, this freedom leads to tension and even to conflicts between individuals, between groups. They are acceptable as long as this does not jeopardize the framework of common sociality that ensures this rivalry is productive and non-destructive. It requires the principle of managed conflict. This means that rules are decided among individuals and groups in a deliberative process, dialogo, como uh, a la tabla. Uh, precedente. This means that rules are decided and these rules are imposed on any individual in equal manner. This is the principle of democratic uh, equality. And this uh, can help to make a different promise than growth, the promise to pursue the common good via the pursuit of the desirable good. What is the common good? It's Aristotle that define this. The feeling that we exist is inseparable from the coexistence and from relations of affection and friendship that make it a valuable common good. This must not be confused with the general interest, which is an utilitarian vision of a feasible combination of individual interest. The proper good of anyone comes must go through the common good. The common good is singular. It is not to be confused with the common goods, plural, which are certainly important to support the pursuit of the common good. Desirable goals, I mentioned here three. First, to respect the dignity of anyone and to give her or him a decent life. I quote here Milton Santos, Never in human history has existed scientific and technical condition as today to build the world of human dignity. Second general goal, to ensure peaceful life for everyone. And third, to target a more symbiotic life with Earth. Constructing new roads, Alandar Seasel el Camino, you make the path as you go. These roads are the tools to be used in order to walk in the direction of the common good. Here, I think uh, uh, we have to work all together on this uh, uh, question. i just say a few words, last words. First, we have to restore the power to the people, to the society as a whole. Ah, ah yes. Thank you to restore the power to the people, 
to the society as a whole. To recover a basic autonomy in deciding what society should do, should produce, should research, should innovate, requires some changes. To introduce the principle of deliberative solidarity within the community to make decisions instead of relying on competition in markets, battlefields, or on sole experts, perhaps. B, to reverse the movement towards the extension of the markets and to start a process of decommodification. Sandel stress on what money can buy, the moral limits of markets. Beyond that moral issue, the French Perret and others advocate that we may have more public services and common goods out of private marketization. And a lot of services could be exchanged without monetization and outside markets. And we may prefer good public collective transformation than individual, even electric, perhaps automatic cars. See, trade, especially in international intra-industry trade, is only justified by the competition conditions, not to answer the need of the people and transportation of these goods is not good for the planet. Production and trade must be answers to the need to improve the quality of life of people, not to rise the amount of exchange values. Short circuits are to be privileged. To care of the other and of nature, Illich would like to make evident to any people that they would be happier if they could work together and care of each other, as we are doing here. This employment, uh, is, the employment issue is related to this idea of care. Full employment on the Fordist Canadian scheme with 40 hours a week is historical. Thus, it is more urgent than at the time of Payne or Stuart Mead or more recently John Kenneth Galbraith could t contemplate the installment of a basic income. It is a difficult task in any community to organize the activities that are necessary to answer the needs of all and to have people working, some more than others. Circular economy, reasonable items, maintenance, non-extraction of resources are your futures among others to take care of nature. Finally, the principle of strong subsidiarity. Hillich wants us a tool beyond a certain threshold from being a servant is becoming a despot, especially high-tech tools. We are all addicted to our emails. The principle of subsidiarity is a principle to limit and to regulate the size of tools, the size of the enterprise, and the size of institutions as well. Elik thought that a lot of institutions in industrialized country had already overtaken the limits they are not only counterproductive, but enslaving people. We are surrounded by mammoth thumbs. This is an unbearable violence to the common good for the sake of power of higher profits and higher shareholder value, and in no case for economies of scale or necessity of a technical size. Laws like the ones who permitted to dismantle giant companies must be acted. Giant firms and banks that are too big to fail would no longer exist and must be dismantled. Uh, even uh, James Calbraith's has kind of proposition is his book, The End of Normal. So many experiences everywhere, like LIPS. I wonder about LIPS if some could have a local currency, which is a way to reinforce the internal system. In the EU, several colleagues advocate for an euro as a common money and not a single money, and nations, regions, why not, could have their local currency. Another idea is that of indicators alternative to the national GDP, alternative indicators assessing the advance in the direction of this new societal paradigm. Why not to measure the societal health of a community, a territory instead of the GDP level, and beyond the rather individualistic UNDP HDI uh, index? PKI in Britain experience with the local territory, the construction of societal indicators of territorial well-being, construction with citizens and for citizens by collective uh, deliberation. And I would have uh, quoted Henry Minzberg, rebalancing society, 
radical renewal beyond left, right, and center. We insist on this plural, which is not business and not state, but made of associations, solidarity, economy. He is optimistic and shows his face in many of ongoing or past experiences, for example, in Brazil, in Brazil with Brazilian people. He ex for example, he quoted the fight against AIDS in Brazil. Hope ahead, I quote him, we certainly need to get our political structures right, but our future ultimately lies with people who care about their country more than just themselves and about the world more than just their country. Why not, people of Brazil? So, why not for our planet? Thank you for your patience.